hi people of youtube and uh the podcast audience uh my name is francis fogel and i am a story strategist and this is my second conversation dedicated to storytelling what good stories are what good storytelling looks like who's doing a great job of it and why we should all understand how the power of stories can help us as individuals as companies as communities and for the world uh my guest today is my friend toby moore i am not going to ask toby what he does because that is a pain point for toby so much so that toby yesterday posted on linkedin you can find him as toby moore on linkedin uh, he posted yesterday about what a painful question it was to ask somebody what they do. And he prefers, what do you make? So we're going to kick off what is probably going to be a deep dive into many, many random things by me asking you, Toby, to introduce yourself and tell everybody what it is that you make. <laughs> well, that really puts the uh, puts the pressure on, doesn't it? Hello, Francis. <laughs> Um, yeah, thank you very much for having me on your podcast. Um, my name's Toby, um, and I make all sorts of things. Uh, I make art, I make music, I make words, uh, I make uh, make tools, and ultimately, I like to think that I make um, thinking experiences for people. Like that's the uh, that's the ultimate pinnacle of my product pyramid, if you like, is thinking experiences and whether that's events, whether that's things that people read, whether that's things that they listen to or see or, or a conversation they take part in um, with the view of, you know, a thinking experience being something that you walk into with, you know, a sense of curiosity or uncertainty and walk away with a sense of opportunity and, uh, and choice and clarity. Um, yeah. I don't think I've ever described it that way myself before. So, but maybe no one's ever asked me that question before. So, well, you invite you invited it, and I was, I was I invited to be the first person uh, okay. in a position of opportunity to ask. So, funnily enough, that you, you mentioned that LinkedIn post that very evening, I went to went to the supermarket, and as I was at the checkout, um, I just asked the guy at the checkout if you had a good day. And he was like, yeah, I've had a good day. Have you had a good day? I was like, yeah, it's been all right. And he was like, has it been busy? And I was like, oh, a little bit busy. Also not very busy at times. He was like, oh, I have interest. What do you do? And I just looked up and I looked at him and I was like, I don't know. <laughs> and then started packing the shopping again. And he was just like, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> It's like not ask an uncomfortable question you get an uncomfortable answer uh, there you go i mean would you now go so far as to say that your bigger system change mission is to get the world asking what do you make and not what do you do um so uh, my business partner and i like are one of our missions if you like is to find the world's best questions so um uh, maybe that's one of them maybe that goes into the archive um it is a better question. It may not be a, a best question, but it's certainly a better question. Have you got another off off the cuff version of a better question of one that we might all be familiar with that you can share? Um, so for me, like building questions is all around figuring out what 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 what's opportunity language and like what language is sort of. Uh, comes from a place of what I call negative constraints and what language comes from a place of like positive constraints. So um, I ask, asking people um, like what, you know, what are they going to do or something like that? Or like what, what happens next or something like that? Just asking questions that, that invite either a kind of a, um, like there's a right or a wrong answer to the question um, or that there is um uh a, a sense of like um yeah a sense of choosing whereas really it should be about trying to understand what possibilities are and interesting i've got some on my desk actually we have these kind of like question cards have i got any here um where we just sort of like yeah okay what might be possible with more and then they just have different things on the other side of the card so you create a conversation and then you 
interject it, but, but the whole idea being like the important language in that question is like, for example, might and might then all of a sudden takes a kind of like, you know, if you go, you know, what, what, what um, uh, it, it, it suggests that there can be many, many correct answers and that there, that there is a, you know, a spectrum of, of, of responses uh, and that, and that by asking what is possible is kind of like, well, it's not about asking about kind of what's actually going to answer this question or move this thing forward or achieve X or achieve Y. It's about kind of like, well, what, you know, what, what is X and what happens if X isn't X? And, <laughs> and I always like to think about these things as like the analogy is like standing at a gate and there's a, and, and that gate there's a path that leads through a field and to the end of that field, but then there's also the field. And it's like, so if you open the gate, what do you do? Do you follow the path through the field or do you choose a new path and you explore the field? And it's uh, um, breaking patterns and breaking old routines. And again, kind of like through the work that my business partner and I are doing at the moment is kind of challenging old habits and routines and things that we feel familiar with, even if those things have served us really well in the past. So both of us are sort of agency background guys. So we immediately always go to that kind of like, what does this look like as a service? What does this look like as a retainer? What does this look like as a project, you know? Um, and challenging all of those frames, ch challenging all of those molds that we've created for ourselves. And again, things that may have served us really well in the past, but perhaps they don't take us to the place in life where we want to be. They just take us to a place where we know what that feels like so just because something feels comfortable it doesn't necessarily mean that it's correct um so to answer your question no i don't necessarily have a specific example because i don't think that's the important thing to focus on i think the, the important thing to focus on is in any given moment like what is the what is the right you know what is a what is a better question to ask and what is what is a better what is better language than the language that's in front of you? Does that make sense as a response? Very much. And actually, thank you, because you've just congratulated me on having done that very thing, because I chose a question that opened up a lot of stuff. So you chose actually, a better question. Yeah. I did. I chose a good question, didn't I, just then? Um, because thank you. I think you've um, you've landed us deeply, very quickly into the important stuff there. So okay. it's making me think about... How important it is to me to expose what I call the shadow, what we all call, not me, but, you know, one might call the shadow side of storytelling. I think there's a lot around toxic positivity and storytelling in the market at the moment. Um, and in the work that I'm uh, doing with organisations, with founders, with people, um, is to firstly translate storytelling, not just you know, around marketing and sales, but uh, into how people are heard, seen, understood, cared for within an organization, how customers are heard, seen, understood, and cared for, and uh, given an opportunity to be involved in a, in a business and the work that an organization can do in its surrounding environments and communities. Mm -hmm. Within that is the need for people to get real about some of the darker sides of stories that they carry as individuals. Oh, yeah. And you mentioned sort of toxic positivity as a, as an example there. And I, um, and I can take, take this in a, I can put a twist on this straight away, which is one of my problems with stories and storytelling. And I think I mentioned to you, mentioned this to you last time we met is that there's almost a, uh either a subtle or an underlying uh inference in 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 the idea of stories and storytelling that this may not be true um and a lot of the stories that we are told as children and a lot of the stories that we're sort of fabled with in order to learn lessons these stories are true there's a point to them but they're not true and um so we we, we very from a very early age we're conditioned to believe in the meaning of stories, but not necessarily in the story itself or the character itself or the events that happen within the story themselves. Mm -hmm. And so if we then look at kind of like the role of storytelling that that plays in us as adults and professionals and so on, 
uh, we're immediately coming from a place where where we don't necessarily have to play, place truth as an important component in a story. Um, and maybe that's one of the factors that takes us into this place where there is so little truth in the world around us and that messages and ideas and characters and events can be manipulated so easily for the purpose of media and content and brand and advertising and whatever. Um, and, and, and it's not to say that stories aren't true, can't be true. And if I were to tell you a story, I told you a story about me going to the supermarket yesterday. It was a true story. You know, the unremarkable stories often are true. Um, um, but, you know, there is a big difference between, you know, I've learned this through doing work, particularly with working with TEDx speakers and also working with young people and vulnerable people and so on, is that sometimes experiences are, you know, understand, well, one of our roles, I suppose, as, as people that are responsible for telling and sharing and collecting stories is to understand the difference between experiences and stories and where they are the same and where they cross over and when they separate and what their role is and what they are as tools and what they are as assets to somebody and what they are as somebody's thing that they own and are asked to look after or, or to respect and so on. Um, and quite often when I'm working with like our TEDx speakers and so on, we're putting together what I call the story catalog. I'll separate it out. Like what is it? What, what is a, an experience in this catalog of stories and what is actually a story? You know, and there are first, there are first, second and third hand stories. First hand stories. I went to Waitrose. This happened to me. The second hand story is, oh, well, Francis told me about this time that she did that. And I'm telling somebody else's story on their behalf. And then a third hand story is maybe something that I've just made up completely, you know, or is made up or is from a book or whatever. And we're using that as a way of um, uh, just providing evidence to a message or an idea. Um, whereas, whereas an experience plays a different role. An experience is about trying to explain your own, um, well, from a from an evidence perspective, it's about believability. We might describe that as credibility or you know verifying or, or something. But like ultimately, it's about trying to trying to create belief, belief in an idea, belief in a concept, and so on. And then there's the empathizing element of it, which is around kind of actually sort of trying to demonstrate a level of personal opinion, experience. Um, you know, why why is it why is it me telling this story and not somebody else from my organization or another organization or what or so whatever? So it's that kind of like why you element of it. And it's like when you and when this story is told and told by this person, something unique happens you know that they are uniquely placed to tell that story or to share that experience and that's something really powerful and that's something to be to be understood and analyzed and, and planned and <laughs> strategy and put into a strategy and so on um yeah so I, I i often encourage people to try and think about the difference between story and experience and again not to say that one was right or wrong it's just about putting that out there and asking that question it's like do you understand what the difference is and what role it plays and whatever it is you're trying to achieve right now? Does that does that make sense? I mean, it's there's a lot of beautiful stuff there. Thank you. Um, in case anybody isn't fully aware at this point, uh, Toby represents one of the two kinds of people that I want to have in these conversations. <clears throat> Toby represents uh, ex an expert in storytelling, as far as I'm concerned, because of these darker, more intricate, uh, complex sides of storytelling. And the other kind of person that I am hoping to profile in these conversations is somebody that, well, uh, many people who represent what good looks like in the world of um, uh, corporate storytelling, business storytelling, founder storytelling. Um, and so my my purpose here is to try to get those who may be unaware of the power of stories, who may not have been encouraged to think about the less glamorous, sexy side of stories, um, to know that there's a place for those for those sides of a story. Um, interestingly, Toby, my brother, so I think you may know that my mother is a group psychoanalytic therapist, and my brother has until now um, made fame for himself as a 
well-known um, music producer, drum and bass DJ, and then music producer, and has decided to become a psychotherapist. Um, so I think in my family, it might... I can see the link. <laughs> yeah. I think in my family, it may well be a case of when and not if all yeah. of us end up becoming therapists, but I'm not one at this time. But my brother sent to me yesterday um, a paper which he uh, is reading at the moment. And I'm obviously not going to read the whole paper, but I do want to just read the title and maybe the kind of brief synopsis um, because it so much speaks to what you have just been talking about. Um, so it's from the British Journal of Psychotherapy uh, 2014. And it's a paper by somebody called Bernadine Bishop. And the title is Anxiety, Symptoms and Containment, A Tale of Two Situations. In this paper, the author considers the relationship between anxiety, symptoms and containment. She notes that the securest of us feel what we can call mature anxiety. Physically, it's different from immature pathological anxiety where development of a part or parts of the self has been arrested. Immature pathological anxiety, which is encouraged and treated in the consulting room, brings with it the bodily upset that is seen in anxiety. In the author's experience, what we struggle with nowadays is far more likely to be variants of what we have come rather vaguely to call personality disorder. In this situation, the anxiety, though intense, is diffused through the self, finding its fateful and addictive manifestations in relationships and their failure, identity, problems, inability to work, and the um, sequelae of that pathological indecision, rage, and a general miserable dissatisfaction with life and what it offers. Um, very thought so it's very optimistic yeah it interestingly uses the model of a tale of two cities Dickens's a tale of two cities to show how different characters um work with uh let me try and let me try and explain why I've just read that to you because it it was it was pretty intense and deep and seemingly irrelevant um at this juncture but there is a connection um so people create stories is where I think you were going to kind of manage for themselves and feel agency around their destiny and in terms of a reflection of where they've come from. And in some cases that can be unhelpful because the story uh, becomes not about dealing with the uh, anxiety or the the problem you might say it's a way of packaging it but then and and sort of systematizing it symptomatizing it in such a way that you can kind of continually try to manage the conditions uh within the story as opposed to kind of the original core issue but the positive side of storytelling is, of course, that you can take yourself kind of from a CBT point of view away from something that's incredibly painful and difficult to work with, unless there is a kind of optimistic, positive resolution. And I really like that quality of how storytelling can work for an individual. Um, but there's a kind of mindfulness and self-awareness involved. Yeah, the positive it? effect of it is that you get to craft the... Um you know, the impact and the, the outcome that you're trying to, that that story is trying to achieve. Um, and it, it so it's not necessarily about kind of like always striving to tell true stories. I don't think that's necessarily the point um, that, that I'm trying to make or that, that, that I think that that's necessarily like an important differentiation. It's, it's that it's, it's, you know, again, like when we're seeing very sort of um, polarised messages and stories in the media about, you know, particularly like, I mean, just come back from America and it's just, you know, <laughs> it, it's mad. Like, I had no idea how mad it is, but it's mad. Like, just the kind of like the sort of Trump style, you know, approach to to politics and media and stuff is just 
you know it's it's so much bigger than than i ever anticipated um but there's the, there's an end in mind now there's an end in mind in order to create a political societal economic um uh you know set of you know environment you know they, they know what they want to build you know whoever it is whoever these people are that are in control of the whole thing <laughs> like they have they have their vision for what the future looks like um and 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 then they use characters and stories in order to drive that change through society um and it so it like like all things that are powerful they become a force for good and they can become a force for evil um and all of the nuanced things in between um so we can develop our tools as storytellers and it's a it's, it's like anything whether it's weapons or whether it's technology or whatever you know it's always being conscious of like what are the the positive potentials and the negative potentials um like what what's harmful and what's helpful um and as we get better and more powerful at using a thing that becomes a responsibility as much as as, a, as an opportunity um and and that can either be seen reflectively as a way of helping and healing yourself like you're referring like you're sort of gleaming from from um from the sort of psychotherapy world if you like or it can be helpful and healing to society and to communities and humanity and so on and the planet um and it's all just a choice like we all get to learn how to use it and then we have to choose how to use it there's yeah there's another really interesting model that i've heard of um in the therapy world so i think many people hopefully many people who will listen who are listening to this may be familiar with the term intergenerational trauma i think it's being banded about quite a lot but i don't want to make any assumptions hopefully i've done my marketing well enough so that i'm not um speaking to too many people for whom i am not and that's what makes me assume that people might know but um we maybe talk about the story of privilege another time um and so just for the sake of clarity what i mean to say when i talk about intergenerational trauma is the kind of inheritance epigenetically um of something that did not happen to you directly in your own life and in fact it kind of mirrors a little what you were saying before about kind of primary secondary and tertiary storytelling to some degree um but there's like another layer of it, which I've heard about recently, which is the kind of unconscious wish to resolve trauma of somebody that came before you. So it's not just a case of you inherit a story that sits within your body that you need to process. In my case, I am a second generation Holocaust survivor, but it's the additional layer of feeling responsible in some way for resolving. And I think uh, I can't speak about that affecting my views you know politically or emotionally at this time personally but I suspect that for some people yes that is coming up Mm -hmm. Um, and so it's a case of with storytelling every time we think we're conscious we have to acknowledge I think also that there's a level of unconscious that might be happening or there's a there's a there's kind of a really amazing opportunity to create resolution and and sort of a um not to say, so what I don't want to be in the business of doing any, uh, is the continuation of whitewashing of the past, but I'd rather have people be able to kind of own the darker side of stories of, of years gone by before them and to try to make good where they can, given their situation. Um, but with that comes responsibility, as you say, and, and, and to hold that in the balance as I like how you describe us as story collectors, And my brand manager, who I've been working really closely with recently, was really keen on sort of, uh, well, we entertain the idea of doula um, as somebody who kind of allows the story to come into the world safely sort of thing. Um, And there was something in that for me that was quite beautiful, but also, yeah, responsible, a sense of responsibility. Um, I wonder if you can actually perhaps at this point speak to your responsibilities and the joys that you get out of your work for TEDx. What do you do? Sorry. What do you make uh, for TEDx? And and do do please share with people whether or not you do or don't toe the party line when it comes to content. 
Yeah, well, um, arguably, don't make anything um, <laughs> in that respect. It's it's other people's um, uh, task and duty to do that. Um, you know, it, it's it's curation rather than creation. You know. Um, Just to be clear, Toby is the director, right, and curator of TEDx Brighton. And as being very modest, but I just wanted to make that clear. Yeah, I've been doing it a long time now. Um, uh, so the, 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 the ego phase has, has disappeared into the past. <laughs> um, but yeah, so we, I mean, I'm just working. I'm literally just getting into Ted, Ted, TEDx Brighton season at the moment and getting very stuck into um, putting speakers and stories and ideas together and figuring out what order everything goes in and what's missing from from that story and so on so and I do I think about the whole day as a as you know first of all it's an experience for people and then secondly it's a story um and the story comes with a selection of questions and choices that the audience gets to sort of infer and then make about their own lives thereafter and, and I feel like my job is done well when the audience walk away with um with with questions that they've created themselves um, about what they want to do next with their life and with their work and so on. And they know what opportunities and options they have available to them that perhaps they weren't aware of before they walked in the door at the beginning of the day. Um, so yeah, that's in terms of what I, I make with that. It's about figuring out what, what constitutes that, that giant sort of, question and that giant giant story that goes across the top and then figuring out what were all the the sort of questions and characters that have to come along the way in order to try and give that the very best chance of success and give everyone in the audience the opportunity to to sort of walk away with those new thoughts and opportunities I suppose um yeah was there a more specific question <laughs> <laughs> around it I can't remember <laughs> sorry no I was thinking about the parallels between the kind of marketing that you and I practice. Um, <clears throat> I would call you in my marketing family. And for anyone listening that doesn't know, I run a community called Better World of Braver, which is designed to help coaches or people helpers, as we like to call them, with um, doing good ethical marketing by putting themselves out there with uh, more confidence, clarity, and joy. And one word that you have just used that I think I'm going to, consider is, is 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 what opportunities are you providing for people and it very much sits within the idea of being the guide and not the hero right and sort of not trying to sell shit from a soapbox but to be able to identify who you're qualified to work for uh, and with in order that they can grow but also to be really clear on your own limits boundaries and needs for example as a, a people helper as a coach so that you're not burning out trying to help the wrong kind of person which in itself is an experience that nobody enjoys um but also just from a practical point of view charging enough spending the right amount of time with people managing your business efficiently um and i'm sure the same could be said for your tedx speakers in so far as their own limits and needs and boundaries are concerned can you talk about your role in their story of kind of creating their boundary yeah, well one I mean one of the one of the most sort of powerful questions that I've stumbled across in the last year or so of doing the kind of work that I do both in and outside of TED is 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 this true and and the last big branding client that I worked for for example like there was lots of language coming from like particularly like senior leadership team and so on, very aspirational kind of like ideas of what the company should and could be and so on. And and I found it a really, really, really useful question for that because a lot of the time, a majority of the time, when I then came back and said, okay, is this true? Eventually through some, you know, form of, of negotiation, the answer was no. Um, and... And it's the same with with the speakers. And actually, there's a, there's a there's a there's a confidence that you can help instill in people when you just give them permission to go up and tell the truth. And all of a sudden, they don't have to make anything up. They don't have to create a message or some great new 
aspiring idea or come up with some super compelling you know tale that's going to change the audience's lives or something because if you just give people permission to say what's true then it's like okay well and then you flip again which is why I'm a big fan of like asking what their experience the, the, you know the important experiences are before we then move on to stories it's like okay well what are the actual experiences that you've had and one of the speakers that I worked with in our last event a guy called Tommy um he uh, he runs a, a a company called Bam Bamboo Brush that sell would you believe it bamboo toothbrushes, but you know their big thing is that that's just the vehicle for 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 a, for a larger body of work, which is a moving away from plastics, moving the world away from plastics, and b um, funding the development of of, of community ran recycling um, sort of uh, what would you call them recycling sort of um, setups in mostly in Africa and Asia. And um, um, and when we were exploring with that, I was like, well, what's the experience that kind of like, you know, when we got to that, he was like, oh, well, actually it was we, me and my girlfriend, he runs the, runs the company with his girlfriend. We were just on this beach in somewhere in some Thai island, island near Thailand. And, and, uh, and it was just covered in plastic. And it was just like, and there was, this was the moment where it was like, I can't, I can't not be involved in this problem and the solution anymore. Like I have to be a part of solving this problem. Um, and for him, it was r rather unseemingly, like it was, it didn't feel like an important story. But then when we looked at it through the lens of, no, this isn't an experience that alleged to you making a decision. Now we get to capture that and decide how we tell it as a story. And you can't get it wrong. Like you can't get telling that story wrong because it's true so you just have to tell it how it happened and yeah there's things that we can do around the order of story points and structure and so on but you know a story that's as simple as that quite often that's just about telling it in chronological order and then and then sharing the decision that you made at the end of it um it's not a complicated story to tell um mm -hmm. so really when it comes to you know, as you're suggesting, is kind of helping people take responsibility of their stories. Really, it's about giving them permission to tell the truth. And it's amazing when you start looking at people and the way that they work and the way that they market themselves and so on. It's amazing how much isn't true. But you don't know that it's not true until you prod it and poke it and ask if it's not true. <laughs> um, and I think that's both the responsibility in terms of like saying responsibility that's a responsibility to the, to the audience to make sure that what we're telling them is is honest and authentic and it's a responsibility to the speaker to make sure that they feel safe on stage because if they suddenly feel lost in a lie even if it's done through very 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 noble means of trying to convince people to go on a very important journey that could you know potentially have you know planet changing positive impact and outcomes and so on but if they f suddenly find themselves lost and alive on stage and they don't know what to do, um, that's not me looking after them very well as a speaker. And that's not me looking after their message very well as a curator. Um, um, yeah, so just the very simple power of, of asking people to tell the truth. And like I said, it's unbelievable how often people are just caught in lies or manufactured narratives around even just the very simple things about why they do what they do. I want to loop back to the cards that you uh, you read one of to us. Yeah. Uh, just ask you, we talk about something in the Better Bolder Braver community, which is the journey of consciousness um, and how marketing is so much about realizing where people are at when you talk to them or bring them something. And I'd like to know, do you shy away from those who are completely unaware of why the power of those questions or the darker side of stories is important to address um, to, from a sort of self uh, preservational point of view? Um, or are you quite keen to somehow bring that education piece into your work where you go in and try to explain to somebody why they need some very penetrating existential questions asked of themselves and of their people and 
when you're looking for speakers? Um, I guess I can answer that question just through two lanes to start with. The first one is actually just from a sort of personal point of view and a, as a business owner, entrepreneur, whatever, is I, I very quickly learned a lesson when I first started my first marketing agent. I described myself as an ex-marketer. I don't believe that I'm a marketer anymore. I don't think I'm very good at it anymore, but I used to be all right at it. And um, um, and I quickly learned that, you know, I was running a content agency. And if I had to spend more than about three minutes trying to convince someone of the value of content to their business, I wasn't in the right conversation. I wasn't with the right person. Like, you know, the very best way of of having an effective sales cycle and and uh, pipeline of clients and so on was to go to people that were that were convinced already of the value of content now they just needed convincing that it was that i was the right person and my company was the right company to to to, to work with them on it um um then changing lanes very quickly my experience working on ted and tedx is very different um, and actually, the best speakers are the ones that that need convincing that they that this is worth their time. Um, you know, particularly the last couple of weeks where we've started to announce our own speakers and so on. Like I, I get two to three dozen inquiries a day, you know, in my inbox through LinkedIn, et cetera, et cetera, of people that want to to speak. Um, um, which is both, you know, a great privilege to to have to be looking after a brand that's that, you know, that that sort of sought after i suppose but also it's a pain in the ass <laughs> um 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 but kind of my one of my first rules with this stuff is kind of is that you know it's 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 much i get much better outcomes for my event when i'm the one that has to go and sell the opportunity um uh rather than being responsive to people pitching me you know the pitching me for the opportunity for them to um be a speaker if that makes sense um and you know we'd still go through our you know application process and people come in and so on but like i i, I quite often the, the 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 ideas that are worth spreading and sharing um the people doing that work the people sitting on those ideas are so busy doing that work and so engrossed in it and so focused on being at the, the front lines of delivering that um that change that the idea of taking three months out to prepare for a talk and then taking two to three days out to travel to a new city to go and talk about it at an event and so on that doesn't feel like valuable work so because it feels like it's taking them away from the thing um and that's not to say that that's everybody but like that if that's you know in my experience that is where the where the the greatest impact on the audience comes from and that overarching story um and so there's an element of and i used to very much be of the sort of the thinking of going the easy thing to do is i'm going to invite you to come and tell your story on this stage um, and I've I've learned now that that's that's the wrong thing to do. Um, asking simply asking someone to come and tell their story um, doesn't it, it it might make for an emotional moment, but it doesn't actually necessarily create any intentional change or present any intentional question or opportunity for the audience. Um, and then it just becomes a sort of a sort of um, emotional masturbatory sort of extravaganza for everybody that's exciting but has no meaning um whereas really and this is a, a practice that, that that ted heavily labor on us as well as as our gods um that we should be looking for ideas and not stories and not people um and that that's the sort of the, the, the pinnacle of the practice that we're in i suppose um and then it's so then really it then becomes this, which is why I design it as a story, because then it's kind of like, okay, what's the story you want to tell? And then what are the what are the events and characters within that story that all need to be there? And then you know, 
okay, well, this is the point where we where we sudden this is the point where we have to prevent present some sort of some 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 new knowledge and some new experience that people can reflect on. This is the point in the story where we start to go, okay, this is how we distill this into a set of options and approaches that you might want to follow or or um or pursue to make that happen. And then and then we have to start thinking about what's the actual kind of practices and behavioral changes and models that can be used in order to make that happen. And then it's kind of like, and then the last part of that story is, you know, is that kind of, well, where does the energy come from? Where does the motivation come from? Where does the permission come from? These are all like crucial elements in that curating practice. Um, and if I go looking for, for people to fulfill those roles, I probably won't find them. Or if I do, um, I, it, because I got lucky. Whereas if I go looking for an idea or a, or a real piece of work that's being done, and then I find the person that's delivering that work, or I go and find a handful of people, and then I'm thinking out of those people, and then and there's, there's an element of kind of like what's appropriate for our community, what fits in from a sort of diversity and inclusion point of view, and so on and so forth. But um, ultimately, it's kind of like what what are all the different ideas that need to pop up along the way and then who are the most appropriate people to come and you know to come and share and explain that um does that make sense i know it's not but and it is not as complicated as it sounds i don't think <laughs> i think i think just i think exemplary of the kind of complexity of um the subject the story of storytelling um and that is something I don't want to put. I don't want to put people off by, um, because at the same time, it's it's stuff that we know very well, all of us. And there's a kind of level to which Toby and I could talk for hours about it um, from an academic point of view, um, and we enjoy that very much, and that's lovely. Um, I think partly what I also want to speak. Uh, well showcased by speaking to Toby is the kind of democratization of of storytelling and the accessibility that you know yes there's all these layers of it um but in itself it's one of the most accessible vehicles for communication and there's a whole history that maybe from one um guest to another I might um hopefully shine some light on again without wanting to kind of go too uh academic on it but that i think is really important for people to know about the heritage of stories the heritage of storytelling and it's making me think about um when i studied theater studies one of the theatrical practitioners that most um inspired me was bert holtbrecht whose um plays and direction of theater was all about getting mobilizing the proletariat and getting the people to get up and do something about something and it's kind of the antithesis to EastEnders. It's the antithesis to kind of being sucked into a drama where you just switch the TV off at the end of it and don't feel like you've got any responsibility other than to tune in tomorrow to see what happens. Um, so I think there's like a renaissance in storytelling at the moment because there is this kind of need for a kind of inclusive, like democratization of, of action. And storytelling is one of the best ways that we can go about a bit like before people could read, you know. Belonging. And I would, I would, I would, I was just thinking whilst you were talking of kind of like, okay, well, what's the there's almost like a like a, a tension behind the the TED thing because uh, to the to the point where an element of me thinks that that TED and TEDx, that world, is actually quite a poor example of effective storytelling. And because it's it's so motivated by conveying a meaning, whereas this type of storytelling that 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 you're alluding to is much more about creating a sense of belonging, I believe, and and that sort of creating connection between people. And when you talk about the heritage or the, her or the sort of the value of heritage in storytelling, that then comes down to kind of like well you know oral oral history you know is is where you know it's kind of like how storytelling emerged you know it's it's the it's the most you know historically effective way of 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 passing down 
knowledge and experiences for generations and and we'll never ever lose that that's our our species is 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 you know that's our gift as a species and um and it's what cr creates community and connection and belonging and i think we could go though into the kind of shadow side of that because i would want to argue against the point it's... you're making in support of mine which is for example, to say that religion, and I don't think you can call it Chinese whispers anymore, it's probably politically incorrect, but the idea of, yes, how wrong things can go over time if they are told and told and told, and to be aware of of the power of that, right? Well, you don't have to necessarily, you know, like it's sort of what I was suggesting earlier, like there's no, a story doesn't have, like in isolation, a story doesn't have any moral compass, only the person telling it. And... So through through that thought, it's it's one person telling a story in the same way that another person telling the same story can be used for different motivations and so on. So it's I suppose I tell you what I've, I've got a, a book over here. Well, you were going to play us the guitar, Toby. I don't think I'm going to torture you to that story. Um, and it'd be lovely if Toby made a song at the end of this because we do need to wrap up, Toby. It, we, we do. I tell you what, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, but I'll wrap up with somebody else's thoughts rather than mine. I found this in a bookshop in Brighton. It's called The Shape of Content, and um, it's written by a Harvard, the, the very first Harvard professor um, uh, who taught art when Harvard first started taught, teaching art. Uh, he was the sort of I don't know the art professor, if you like. Um, and his the whole thesis of the book is basically there is a differentiation between form and content. Um, and you, the artist, have to decide what your relationship, the relationship that you're going to create between form and content is. And form is the art of storytelling, if you like, the act of storytelling. The content is the story itself. And the two exist separately. And you the person who's responsible for these two things has to decide how they come together and how they're used uh, and which, which, you know, and which are you, are you the person, you know, are you the content person or the form person, or are you the, 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 the alchemist of both? Um, and I think that's where the, the ultimate kind of end point of, is this used for good? Is it used for evil? Is it used to, drive some sort of political campaign is it used to sell bamboo toothbrushes like whatever is that you need to be conscious of the decisions that you're making everything has to be intentional and deliberate and then all of a sudden the story has meaning again as soon as something is overly subconscious or accidental or unpredictable or improvised or whatever you it's not necessarily a bad thing but you can't control the outcome you can't design the outcome and you have to decide whether you're telling stories for the sake of telling stories in order to create joy and connection, you know, um, indifferent from the meaning of the story. Um, or are you trying to drive a specific change in an outcome? And if you are, be very deliberate about the story that you're telling and how. Tune in next time for a continuation of Art for Art's Sake and oh, the for argument that. with Toby Moore. Um, I should just flag to listeners um, that you are also the author of a book, which you might at this juncture like to market, please, because it's so relevant to the discussion. It's called Make It. It's how to work with clarity, confidence and creativity, uh, available from all good Amazon um, <laughs> absence tours. <laughs> uh, yeah, I wrote this um, nearly a year and a half ago now, something like that. Um, and yeah, it's 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 my guidebook, if you like, field guide to having more creative freedom in your life and your work. Um, I understanding the value of that, understanding how your ideas enable that, and and you know, the plan that you create for yourself in order to go go ahead and build that, to build that world and that work for yourself, where you get to decide what it is that you make and then and who you're making it for and the value that it holds and so on. Um, and I like it. I like my own book and that's high praise in, I suppose. <laughs>
And I like you, Toby. Thank you very much for being my guest and my friend. And I hope this hasn't been too much of a masturbatory rabbit hole for everybody into the world of storytelling. Thanks to Toby and Francis. Um, I will love you and leave it there. And thank every thank you to everybody who has uh, dedicated their valuable time to listening. I'll speak to you soon. <laughs>